the thing that I want to pick up on that Dan mentioned is, is the whole piece around building a business that actually is bigger than you, that actually uh, is something that outlasts the founder, that is bigger than the founder, uh, that is in itself an asset. I was with someone this morning, and I, I use the phrase uh, floating off the business. I don't mean necessarily in the way of a, 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 an IPO, but actually the company actually becomes something separate uh, to the entrepreneur. So Coffee Nation was my company uh, on the left, uh, you'll see what was the, the latest version of the, of the business before we sold the company. Uh, this was a self-serve gourmet coffee station. Uh, it was the ATM of, of Espresso. Has anybody seen Coffee Nation? Do you remember that? Yeah, that brand, quite a few hands. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is what it's become today called Costa Express. Anybody seen those machines? Very good. Um, when we sold the company, we had uh, about seven or 800 machines around the UK. And now there are something like, I think, 5,000 uh, Costa Express uh, units across the country and, and, and Europe and the, and, the far, and the Middle East. So, um, but how did I start? What was, my, what was my background? Well, I had a consulting firm uh, in the early 90s, and that was great. It was a good lifestyle business, as, as Dan mentioned earlier. One of the challenges with that, though, was that it was a, 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 a daily fee, uh, it was a pay by the hour or whatever it was, you know, uh, with, with clients and, um, and consultants. And I found that was a limiting concept if I was going to scale and grow something bigger. And so I set about looking for an idea, a business concept uh, that could be bigger than me, that could make money, sounds cliche, but make money whilst I sleep. And so I started looking around and I came across my idea in that hotbed of entrepreneurial innovation and, and thinking, uh, the local Common and Garden news agent. Um, but I kid you not, uh, the idea did came to, come to me from that, from that location, and it was all about the simple photocopier machine. And I read an article uh, about uh, a US company that put photocopiers into news agents, drugstores. This is a big business. They've got 30,000 machines around the, U the US and coming into Europe. So I like this idea uh, because for two reasons. One, it was a little bit of revenue from lots of locations. Two, uh, it would work whilst I wasn't there. Three, it wasn't dependent upon highly paid fickle consultants, which was a bonus uh, from my previous business. Uh, and, th and, and, and four, uh, there were thousands of places. Dan mentioned distribution channels and, and routes to market earlier. Uh, so there are thousands of, of news agents around the UK that I could get into. The question was, what would be the product? So I, off I disappeared off to the US. Uh, because I figured that a lot of good ideas often emerge in the US and, and somehow find their way to the UK. And I literally spent time in Manhattan. I got an uncle in, in, uh, in Brooklyn. I used to get the, the, the metro into Manhattan each day and literally walk in the streets looking for ideas. And I remember on one particular day on, there was, on one street corner there was this thing called Starbucks. Now at the time I was aware that food and beverage was increasing in quality in the UK, particularly in London. There was this thing about food on the move or eating on the go. Uh, and there was something about coffee that was starting to emerge. But it was very early days uh, in the UK in that sense. So Starbucks wasn't here, of course, uh, then. This was about 1996, yeah? So 20-odd years ago. On the other corner of the street, there was a 7-Eleven store, just like the one you see here. And in that store, uh, they had, behind the counter, a row of filter coffee jugs. And I went in, and I just kind of observed what was happening. And people were buying this coffee, literally, you know, it was flying out the door. A dollar a cup, styrofoam cup, uh, it was hugely popular. And so I figured that could be a great idea to take back to the UK and put into those corner shops. Uh, and, and that would be my, my concept. And I'd work it on the same kind of idea as the photocopier model. So I returned to the UK, uh, and I did my research. And I looked at some real espresso machines, such as you would find in a Starbucks, but figured that they were so expensive that I couldn't afford them. I couldn't make my business plan work with those kinds of numbers. They were very, very expensive. But what I did do was find a simple tabletop uh, coffee machine. It whisked uh, instant coffee granules with powdered milk. I met with Nestle, who owned the Nescafe brand, and they were keen to get their brand out into non-traditional locations. So I did a deal with Nestle. They'd supply the coffee. They'd also supply point of sale material and signage. And I designed this, this, uh, this metal unit, this cabinet that the machine would sit on with cups and lids and a bin and so on. And that was one of my first units. Uh, it was in a convenience store down in Kent. And uh, it whisked coffee granules, mixed it with powdered milk, 
uh, and about the only thing worse than my crappuccinos was my fashion sense. Um, <laughs> but it got me going. The drink was 49 pence, it was cheap, um, and uh, it, 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 didn't, it wasn't very spectacular. The results were poor, to say the least. I probably didn't sell more than about 50 cups of coffee per week per, per machine. Uh, but I was, I was ignorant, I was naive, and I was confident. And, and I was actually onto something. And the bit at the bottom of the slide, I owned the kit and split the revenue with the shop. That was part of the IP, if you like, that Dan mentioned earlier. But I didn't even know it at the time. That was hugely important. And it was that business model that was pivotal to our future success. So I, I put it along. Uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty desperate times, in fact. Uh, that was middle of 90, early 97. And by early 98, I was nearly out of money. I think I was 10 grand over a 30,000 pound overdraft. Uh, and it was, it was almost curtains. I tried everything to try and boost sales of my coffee. Uh, I gave it one last shot of the, uh, of the you know, roll of the dice. And we had one machine. I've got machines all over the country. Uh, I tied up with a couple of convenience store chains. But I was trying to please the customer as opposed to work out what would make my business work. And so I was a bit of a busy fool. And I realized this late on that I was just going to give it one last shot. And I went out and I went to one of the locations we had. It was a convenience store and a petrol forecourt in the West Midlands, very similar to the picture you see there. And I went in, I went up to my machine, and of course it was spotlessly clean because nobody ever used it. Um, and uh, spoke to the manager and so on and so forth. Anyway, the guy came in and he w went up to the machine. I thought, hey, he's going to buy a cup of coffee. And he sort of approached the machine and turned and walked away again. And sort of, you know, I sort of sank, you know. Um, and anyway, he turned to me and he said, have you got anything to do with this, with this business? And I said, yes, it's my idea, it's my, it's my company. And he said, well, let me tell you something. He said, I think this is a great idea. And I sort of perked up. And he said, but there's a but. And he said, if you want me to buy uh, this kind of product in this location, then you've got to wow me. Because the problem with what you're selling is I can go back to my office on the opposite corner of the road, I can put the kettle on, I can get a jar and S cafe out of the cupboard, and I can make the same thing that you're selling it for 49 pence for. I can make it for free and just as quickly. So there's no wow, there's nothing in the product. And in that moment, I realized the folly of my, of my ways. I'd focused on finding a cheap coffee machine because I couldn't afford the real expensive espresso machine. So I'd put costs first, not the product. What I needed to do was make the product the hero and wow customers. So key point number one, Unless you wow customers and knock them off their feet and jerk them off their autopilot of their daily lives, you're not going to get anywhere. You've really got to punch through and get noticed. It was important then. It was critical back 20 years ago. It's even more so today. People are jockeying for every space of market. So I got to plan B. I'd written a business plan. It was completely a complete waste of time. I had this eureka moment. I ditched the Nestle relationship. I blagged my way to getting some real espresso machines, such as you see here. Um, and it was real beans, it was fresh milk. I put the drink price up to 69 pence. The sales rocketed, literally 50, 60, 100% sales uplift overnight. So what I now knew I'd got was proof. I'd actually got evidence that I was actually onto something. This was a minimum viable product, as you might call it. Pretty Heath Robinson. The machine sat on an MDF unit. If you spilt coffee on it, it would fall apart. The milk pipe from the fridge to the coffee machine, it was at ambient temperature. So if you didn't clean it about every 20 minutes, it would fur up and you'd get you know, poisoned. Um, <laughs> but it was, but it, was, it was just enough to give me the evidence I needed. So let me just tell you that the combination of an entrepreneur with proof and evidence that they're onto something that can be really big with confidence is just unstoppable. So from this point on, I just apps, I was out of cash, remember, but I knew that I got something that worked. I got evidence, I got customers buying and telling me this was great. And the price had gone up, the sales had shot up, I was on a roll. So from that point, I was able to sort out my financial position. I raised some seed capital uh, from some business angels, and that meant that I could develop the concept further. And what you see here was uh, one of four machines we had, two in Texaco petrol forecourts, and two in Welcome Break Motorway Services. This was by now uh, early 1999. And the machine was this big, hairy ass thing that was built like a brick shit house. Uh, and it had an onboard milk refrigerator, so you now got milk that was at chill temperature all the time. Uh, and you can see there was, a, there was a unit around it, it was backlit, uh, and it captured people's attention in the store. Um, and, uh, and we were off and away. Moving on, we were then able, so this was me. I had a guy who became my chairman. 
uh, and mentor. And by now, I'd also recruited my, my operations director. And we wrote a business plan. And it was the first business plan I'd ever needed to write, basically. Uh, so there's another valuable point there. Most business plans written by early stage entrepreneurs are hope documents. They are utter fantasy. And people try to raise money uh, to keep them alive whilst they figure out what the fuck to do with their startup business. Um, that's not when you need money. And people smell that desperation and fear. This business plan, on the other hand, raised £4 million. Uh, this was at the height of the dot-com bubble. Uh, and uh, we raised a lot of money. And we're off out the traps and off we went. So, that meant we could develop the concept further. On the right-hand side is then what we rolled out with. It was a meter and a half wide. That was in a Tesco Express convenience store. You can see we've got fresh coffee at the top. We've got a floor graphic. That was the mainstay of our rollout. Uh, we, we rolled out about 800, 700, 700 of those machines across the UK. On the left, that's in a welcome break retail shop. When the sales reached about 250 cups a day, we could double up and put a second machine and the unit on the right, again, is in a Tesco Express store. Each of these machines were linked back to base. We could see if they were being cleaned and filled each day by the staff in store. Uh, we could see what the volume of drinks were being sold, and so on. We created an asset that sat in the marketplace. So the idea itself was the, was the data. We created this new category, and then we could attack uh, a large market. A bold new market category, branded self-serve gourmet coffee stations 24-7, the evolution of the high street coffee bar, et cetera, et cetera. Birth of a brand, Coffee Nation equals the category. If you can't find something that, where you can own territory and space and you're going to enter into a crowded market, don't do it. Go and find something where you can be utterly differentiated. You've either got to be 1,000, 10,000 times better than other people or do something different. Uh, usually, entrepreneurs start off by trying to be better, and it's often better to be first than it is to be better. We discovered that actually uh, we had a high uh, impact to the retailer. Our sales and profit density per square foot outstripped virtually every other category in stores. And that was underpinned by the fact that we owned this piece of real estate in the store. We had these things called brand guardians and quality crusade and brand audits. So there was this whole, if you think of like a swan, it's very serene on the surface, but underneath the feet are paddling away quite hard. And, and that was our operating system. It was what enabled us to deliver a great cup of coffee 24-7 in some pretty you know, tough, demanding uh, environments. The point is here, Coffee Nation doesn't come cheap. So if you just want to sell a cup of coffee, go and deal with somebody else. Because we were a tiny company, but we recognized our power because of the impact that we were having on the retailer. And that's the power that you can have if you've got a category, if you've got a tiger by its tail, uh, such that, that, that we had. We didn't set about building a brand. Our focus was, was to make sure that every time we sold, we dispensed a cup of coffee, it was awesome. And the key thing was we needed to make sure the machines were live, were trading all the time. And over the period that I was CEO for over a decade, we averaged 99.7% trading availability. But the point here is that the brand is built by your customers. It's not built by you. A brand isn't a logo or a strap line or the color of your paper or whatever it is. The brand is the, ex the collective experience and the emotional feel and, and, and attachment that customers have with your brand. What does it do for them? And the point here is that we talked about ourselves. We didn't talk about pleasing corporate customers. We made sure that we were the absolute best at leading our category and owning our space. And we were damn certain that nobody else would get in on our act. So to, to put it into a practical con context, this again was a slide that we, uh, from, from an early presentation, uh, when we had those trials with Texaco and Welcome Break. So a great way to do it is to find a small market that's growing fast. So the coffee bar market, the speciality coffee bar market, this is back in uh, 98, 99, was growing enormously. It was 180 million pounds at that point. It's a two and a half billion pound market today, and it's still growing. There was no downward pressure on prices. Starbucks have got probably that, that number of stores in the UK today, let alone worldwide. So we'd found this small market growing fast, and then we got in and did something that others couldn't do. And this letter is from the retail director of Welcome Break. And he said, we're going to put it in as many places as are economically viable. Who the hell doesn't want to get a letter like that land on their desk? So that meant that we could then go and raise the £4 million. In terms of positioning, again, as Dan mentioned earlier, we had this neat position. So what I've been able to identify was you've got traditional vending on the one side. Everybody thinks, you know, if they talk about vending, pretty shit coffee, etc. It's a distressed purchase. 
Coffee bars on the other extreme, high price, premium locations, labor, real estate, coffee, newspapers, jazz music, croissants, etc. We were in the middle, high pricing of a coffee bar, premium quality, some degree of experience, uh, a destination purchase could also be distress, certainly it could be a planned purchase. So we inhabited a, a clear territory, a clear space that wasn't occupied by vending and wasn't occupied by a coffee bar. We created a new niche for ourselves in the marketplace. When we came to sell the company, uh, we did something called due diligence where we were, we were checked out, the management, everything what, you know, that we said, our customer relationships and so on were validated by an external third party. And uh, one of the companies that they went to, one of our corporate customers, they said that Coffee Nation has a unique offer. They're cornering the market. No one is fighting back. I mean, what a great place to be. We were a monopoly. We owned the space. We had a couple of companies come and try and attack and undermine what we were doing, but we made damn certain that nobody else uh, could get into our space. People say monopolies are bad, surely. Of course they're not. If you absolutely own a piece of space and you do it brilliantly and make life better for people, whether it's business to business or business to consumer, then that's awesome. 2007, on the right-hand side, that was our IM information memorandum that was prepared for the sale of the company. And the companies on the left were all the contracts uh, that we had, uh, and that enabled us to sell the company very successfully. We had a lot of PR coverage. Uh, this was the piece from Tesco about how they were going to challenge uh, coffee bars, and indeed did, so, did do very well. And we won lots of awards. We were uh, a top 100 UK fastest growing private company for multiple years. Uh, I was an Ernst Young Entrepreneur of the Year award winner. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. So how do we do? Uh, as, as da oh, there you go, 600 sites in seven years. I forgot myself now. 911. The original business plan was 1,000 sites in five years. So we were, an ex we, we were a new category with enormous growth potential. But these things usually take longer to happen uh, than people expect. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Uh, when I sold the company, by then we'd, sold, uh, we'd served over 100 million customers. We'd done it all with 50 employees. Uh, we made lots of mistakes along the way. Of course we did. Um, but you know, time doesn't permit me to go into those today. But the upshot was, between two exits, there were 80 million pounds of proceeds that came to uh, the shareholders. So we all did extremely well financially, and the company's still flourishing today, as you know, from Costa Express.